We might say that even until today, Israel is still trying to find rest. Rest for the body is important. It's a need for all humans. Even the land we see needs rest. Was God simply acknowledging that the Israelites were tired from 40 plus years of, uh, of traveling in the wilderness? Did Yahweh mean that entering the promised land and taking it was the rest that he had promised? Had God promised Israel rest? Had he, had he really promised that? If so, when and why? Does this not seem like an odd promise when all things are considered? Why wouldn't God simply promise them peace or just the land or even prosperity? I mean, he did promise those things, but why rest? It just seems kind of odd, isn't it? I mean, if you, if you were to ask God or, or pray as you were doing, you know, invading this land, would you pray for rest? I mean, the more we study the Bible, the more it makes sense. And I think we'll, that's the point we're making here is many do not realize that the idea of rest is running like a thread through the entire body of Scripture. This idea of rest goes through the whole Bible. It's much larger than even Israel. Uh, and, and that's why we need to really pay attention to it. So let's take a few minutes and run, do a little Bible study here, trace this through. So number one, we see that Canaan was to be a place of rest for God's people. Every time we see God referring to giving the people this land, the promised land, he usually refers to how this is going to be their place of rest. And, you know, if we put it into context that they had, that Abraham had left Ur of the Chaldeans so long ago, over 400 some years before this, um, that Abraham traveled from Ur, which is over near the Crescent, uh, Fertile Crescent goes across the highway. They had highways back then. Across the highway uh, to Haran, at, which was the normal way you would do this, and then down the, uh, the, the route into the land of Canaan uh, by the Mediterranean Sea. We get our backward sea. Here's the Mediterranean which the Bible calls the Great Sea. And then we have the Canaan area, and then below that is Egypt. So here's Abraham coming down with Lot and uh, his nephew and all of their belongings. And Abraham does what? Well, he goes into the land of Canaan, and God says, every place where you step your foot, I'm going to give to you. But now Abraham did wander around though, didn't he? He was, a, he was sort of nomadic. The Bible records that Abraham went to one place and he would dig a well, build an altar, and stay there for a while. Then he would go somewhere else, dig a well, build an altar, and stay there for a while. He did it the whole time moving around. And in Abraham's lifetime, he did not inherit the land. In fact, of the land that God said that he would give to Abraham, the only portion that he owned at his death was the portion that he purchased to bury his wife. That's all he owned. And then, of course, Isaac comes into the picture. We've got the same thing kind of happening with Isaac. You kind of get the idea that Isaac 
settled down more than his dad, but he never really inherited the land. And Jacob and so forth, Jacob and his sons go down into Egypt. 400 years later, they're in slavery. And God delivers them out of that. And now they're traveling through the desert because of their disobedience. There you go. God adds another 40 years <laughs> in the desert. So that whole generation dies. And then a new generation moves into the land of Canaan. So now over 400, almost 500, maybe, maybe almost 600 years have gone by. And they're just now entering the land. So if you look at it in that view, that God would say, here's, here's the land. You can, you can finally rest. You can plant roots. You can finally own this that I've been promising you all these years. And so there's that idea of rest that the Bible uh, gives us. So, and so that's why God refers to the land as their place of rest so many times. In Exodus chapter 33, we see it. It says, and he said, my presence, this is when Moses, um, when, when, when God's, Moses says to God that I will go if you go with me uh, after the people's rebellion. And so Exodus 33, 14, and he said, this is God, at my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. Joshua eleven twenty three. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments. And the land had rest. From war. 1415. Now the name of Hebron formerly was Kiriath Arba. Arba was the greatest man among the Anakim. Remember, the Anakim were the giants. So Arba was the greatest of the giants. And so they named the city after him, Kiriath, city of Arba. And, he, and the land had rest from war. 21, 44, and 45, we read, The Lord gave them rest on every side, just as he had sworn to their fathers. And then, of course, it makes this claim, Not one of the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed, all came to pass. And 22, verse 4, And now the Lord your God has given you rest to your brothers. This is referring to the, the uh, tribes on the eastern side. Therefore, turn and go to your tents in the, in the land where you, your possessions lie, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of of the Jordan. God has given rest to your brothers. The, in other words, he's speaking to the ones that are going back across the river to the east side. And he's saying to them, since God has given your brothers, that's the ones here on the west side uh, in the main part, portion of Canaan, he's given them rest. Now you men are free to go back to your homes and uh, work what your families and work your farms and, and so forth on the eastern side. So God is saying, or, or he's, Joshua is saying, you finished your, you fulfilled your responsibility. God has given them rest. Now you go enjoy your rest, as it were. So what's going on here? I mean, you've got all this reference to rest and the, the land is rest from war and so forth. Well, there's clearly much more to this than just being tired. I mean, we can see that, can't we? There's something about the land needs to rest. Here's the people need to rest. 
that the eastern tribes needed to fight with the western tribes until they got their rest and so forth. So this is a, a, a very big topic uh, in, his, in Israel's history. We might say that even until today, Israel is still trying to find rest to this very day. Number two, we see that rest had always been a part, uh, has always been a part. Y'all were holding that in, weren't you? Y'all were like, he don't see that, does he? How's that? Rest had always been a part of God's plan. It's always been a part. What does that mean? Well, if you go back to Genesis, all the way back to the book of Genesis, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God finished His work that He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Was God tired? <laughs> no. Are you tired after six days of work? Yeah. Yes, there's the physical part. But in reality... God here in Genesis um, is giving us much more than physical rest that we see here uh, in verses 1 through 3. Why and how do we know that? Well, because God set the example by resting. And we know God's not tired. There is something unique about this rest. Is it just an example that, okay, well, I'm God, you're human, you're, I'm infinite, you're finite, you, I'm all-powerful, you're not, so I'm going to rest so you can learn from that. Is that all it is? I don't think so. And I think the Bible continues to show us that. Now, is that part of it? Yes, it is. God knows what's best for us, and He knows that we need rest, physical rest. God rested on the seventh day. God commanded His covenant people to rest on the Sabbath day. Now, theologians have argued a lot right here. They've, they have said, when God rested on the seventh day, was he commanding that all who believe him or believe in him as the true God, they are bound to worship God on the Sabbath or the seventh day? Okay, so... Or seventh... Was God setting down right there a commandment? Well, I think in some ways he was. And right now I'm not really going to want us to debate that, but just to understand that this has already been a discussion. Theologians for centuries have already seen that worship and rest are related. Did you see what, what's going on there? And we continue to see that unpacked when hundreds of years later, uh, we, or yeah, even more than that, Moses comes along and God gives him the commandments. And we see in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, that God does explicitly command it in the, in, the, in the Mosaic Covenant. He now comes, if there was any question before, 
he clarifies it now and lays it down as a commandment. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. And this is why we say it probably was a commandment. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Holy, set apart, sanctified, holy, specifically for God. That's what that means. And we see it also in Leviticus chapter 23, verse 3, Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath. Sa Sabbath. Rest. To the Lord in all your dwelling places. So, Shabbat, rest. Rest on the Sabbath day. Worship. So, rest and worship are together. Keep that in your mind because that's where this is going. God also assigned other times of rest for his people Israel. God didn't just stop with the seventh day. He expands on this idea of rest. In Exodus 23, verses 10 through 12, we have laws about the Sabbath and also the festivals or the feasts of Israel. For six years, six years, you shall sow your land and gather in its field. But the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie fallow. And of course, we know now that you have to let land rest, don't we? We know that. For the land to recuperate, you have to give it time to recuperate. Now, now we, we use chemicals and so forth, to, and, and we use crop rotation and so forth to, to try to keep this going. That's modern man. You know, we can't follow God's method. We've got to figure out a way around it. And we overwork the land. But anyway, that's what God was telling the people. Six years you work. Your fields, the seventh year, do not plant a crop. Let it rest. And what they leave, uh, it says, and, and let it lie fallow, that the poor on your peop of your people may eat, and what they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. There's the welfare program. It's there in the, <coughs> excuse me, it's there in the field. You just got to go get it. Take that for whatever it means. <laughs> Six days you shall go do your work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. That your and, and why should you rest? Rest. Quote, that your ox and your donkey may have rest, and the son of your servant woman, and the alien or the foreigner, the stranger, uh, the traveler who's in your land uh, may be. Refreshed. So even, the, even foreigners that come into the land of Israel, they were encouraged to participate in the Sabbath and so forth uh, for their own good. Now, many times Israel didn't obey this. But we've got this fest festival. We've got the seven-year Sabbath. We have the festival of trumpets in Leviticus 23, uh, and through 25, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel saying in the seventh month, on the seventh day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest. Notice it's not just rest. Solemn rest. That doesn't mean that you have to frown and be unhappy. That's not what it means. It means it's holy. It means it's a time set aside to worship and reverence God and rest your spirit 
and your body and everything else within the society. A memorial proclaimed with a blast of trumpets, a holy convocation, which is what we're doing right now, a gathering of the people of God. And you shall not do any ordinary work, ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. Leviticus 23, 26 through 32, the day of atonement, highest day of the year in the Jewish calendar. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, now on the earth, I mean on the 10th day, excuse me, of this seventh month in the day of atonement, it shall be for you a time of holy convocation and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is the day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whatever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from the people. That's a pretty big deal. You don't honor this day. You're cut off from the congregation of Israel, the people of Israel. He says, and whoever does any work on that day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest and you shall afflict yourselves. And on the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening, shall you keep your Sabbath. The Feast of Booths, we have it in Leviticus 23, through 30, uh, 23 33 through 39. The, and then the Sabbath year or the year of Jubilee, every 50 years, the 50th year, the whole year is a, re, a year of rest. So this is a complex system of rest that God has given his people. Why is this so important? Is it just about land and good crops and donkeys? And <laughs> No, it's not. It's about way more than that. Is it just about worship? Not that that's a small thing. Well, it actually is a little more than that too. Rest for the body is important. It's a need for all humans. Even the land we see needs rest. Nations need rest from war. Communities need rest from work. The pursuit of God and obedience to his word bring rest to each person, community, nation, and church. What did we happen, happen here? God rested. What happened in Exodus? Honor the Sabbath. And what am I supposed to do to honor the Sabbath? Worship God. And we see that each time of these feasts and day of atonement and so forth, what were they to do? Make an offering, have a holy convocation, worship God, and so forth. So this is the rest. God knows we're a whole being, not just bodies. We're spirits as well. And God knows that our spirit needs uh, rest as well. But how does the spirit rest? Well, number three, being rightly related to God leads to rest. Where is all this going? Well, now we're going to see. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 16 through 19. The, the New Testament writer to the Hebrew Christians says, For who were, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled. This is referring back to the people of God as they were coming out of Egypt. And they're following Moses. And what did they most often, what are they most often known for with Moses? Sorry? No, what are the people mostly known for as they followed Moses? Complaining. The old King James Version said, murmur. They murmur. 
My, I remember my Old Testament professor, he said, murmur is one of those words that sounds like what it is. Murmur, murmur. It's like murmur. <laughs> it's true. You know, they were complaining. I don't know what, there's a term for that, but I, don't, I can't remember what it is. But anyway, he's right. So this is what's going on. The people of God are following Moses, but they're complaining. They're not believing God. They're not marching really in victory. They are complaining and sinning, and God is constantly having to chastise them. Well, this is what the writer to the Hebrews is, is accessing. He is going back to that, that reality, and, but he is applying it to New Testament Christians. All right? For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest. But to those who were disobedient. So we see, the writer says, that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. The land of rest was way more than just walking into a piece of property. The reason that first generation was not allowed to go into the land of Canaan but had to wander in the desert for 40 years is because they did not believe God. They argued with God and they fought with God and God said, you will not go in to the land of rest. Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Our Lord Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Boy, that makes so much more sense now, doesn't it? Where do we get this rest? Israel's been trying to get this rest for thousands of years. In fact, they're still trying to get it today. In the land. I'm not criticizing them today. They're defending themselves. But I'm still saying they're still trying to defend that land and get themselves some rest. But in reality, the rest only comes from being rightly related to God. And Jesus is saying, come to me. I'll give you rest for your souls Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Beautiful words. Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, Jesus is challenged about the Sabbath. And Jesus says at that, or the scripture says at that time, Jesus went through the, the grain fields of the, on the Sabbath day. And his disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. See, they thought it was about work. So they set up all of these rules. To make the law of God doable. They missed the point, didn't they? He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Notice where he went and got the bread. At the tabernacle. The, the house of God. 
Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? In other words, the priests on the Sabbath are working, they're working all day. They're doing sacrifices and, and all that, and yet they're not condemned for working on the Sabbath. Why? Because they're worshiping God. And if you had known what this means, our desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have condemned the guiltless. You would not have condemned the guiltless. And here it is. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus offers rest and he offers it by faith. We see this in Romans chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. That is why it depends on faith, Paul says, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be grant, uh, guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the ad adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of, of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Abraham believed God and it was accounted unto him for righteousness, the Bible says. God is, I mean, Abraham is the father of faith. And so are we his children because we have come to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, the rest of God rests upon grace, not the fulfilling of the law of the Old Testament. Hebrews chapter 4, if you don't mind turning there uh, quickly, we're almost finished, but I just can't not give you this um, it's uh, such a, a key to this whole, whole passage. Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, this is referring to that people of Israel coming into the promised land. He says, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest, God's rest, still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message that they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he said. Quote, I swear, I swore, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So what he's saying is there was a group with Israel that did not enter Canaan. And why? Because they refused to believe God like the others. Well, who were the others? Joshua and Caleb, pretty much. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. See how it all connects? The writer to the Hebrews went all the way back to Genesis. And again, in this passage, he said, They shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news failed to enter it because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day. Today, quote, saying, Through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, that's, God would not have spoken of another day later on. What he's saying is Joshua took them into the land, but did they ever really get full rest? Not really. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. You read in Joshua 22 that all of the promises of God 
came to pass there. Remember that? And now in Hebrews, he's saying they did not get a full uh, fulfillment of rest. Well, why not? Well, the truth is because Christ had not come yet. They could not have the complete rest, which is what the writer of the Hebrews is saying. That's why he spoke of another day. Another day. Why? That day that the Messiah would come. Today, if you harden not your, your hearts, if you hear his voice, that's the day of the Messiah. That's a messianic promise, a messianic passage. So then, verse, verse 9, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his works. One of the reasons why Joshua could not give them full rest is because they had just been given the commandments of God. They were under the law. Grace had not come yet. The Messiah had not fulfilled the law yet. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. What's that mean? In other words, he's saying, listen, strive to stay with Christ. Believe Christ. These were Hebrew Christians who were being persecuted. They were literally discussing going back into Judaism. And the writer is saying to them, stay with Christ so that you might have the rest or salvation. That's what he's saying. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. I come to me, I will give you rest. Salvation. So in conclusion, Christians also labor in this life. You say, well, pastor, I feel tired. You know, C.S. Lewis wrote uh, a little piece called The Lord Knows You're Tired. Why would he do that? 2 Corinthians 7, 5 through 7, For even when we came into Macedonia, the Apostle Paul says, Our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and, fire and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he comforted by you, as he told us, your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejo rejoiced still more. Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. And they cried out with a loud voice. And here's what they cried. O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Revelation 14, 12 through 13. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, John writes. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Now we labor and toil for the Master. 
Now we rest in His forgiveness and salvation. Tomorrow we rest in His bosom and are comforted by His staff. James told us that in a different way. In chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is the one who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life or salvation, which God has promised to those who love him. You see, even in this life, we have part of that rest, but we're still laboring, aren't we? Life still is hard. And there are times when, as Paul said, I think I'd rather go be with Christ but it's better if I stay here. But when our life is ended, then we get the full rest of God and His eternal kingdom. The rest that He's been promising us completely since Genesis chapter 2, but was lost by Adam, but regained for us by Christ. What a say. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to our latest video. Go ahead and click that little thumb so you can like that video, as well as on the bottom right hand corner, click that little bell to subscribe and receive notifications. Thank you again so much for tuning in, supporting our video ministry here at Cognitive Church.